Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. I'm going to throw it in the atmosphere. I'm going to put it out there. We got Mayor Eric Adams on the line. What's up, brother? Hey, good to see you, Envy, and my girl, uh, Angela, Angie, and uh, Charlemagne, just all of you. It's good seeing you. I'm happy to be on the show again. Right. And, you know, we are we have already started early voting on Saturday. And so the deadline is November 2nd. So are you encouraging people now to make sure they get out and vote? Uh, yes, yes, I, I am. And, you know, your show played a significant role as you entertain people daily. You also have some very serious conversations. And, you know, during the primary, folks used to walk up on me and say, listen, I heard you on Angie Yee's show. And so don't think you're not reaching the masses. You know, in particular, we have a connection because you are our Brooklyn Borough President. So I'm very excited for you to be the next mayor because of the work that you've done in Brooklyn. But it was a tough weekend in Brooklyn. You saw what happened at the Barclays on Sunday with the anti-vaxxers and them wanting Kyrie to play. What do you think about all these mandates that are happening right now? Well, I know what COVID did to our city. You know, I was there and, you know, sister, I was on the ground. A lot of people fled, but, you know, I was there and led some of these uh, battles that we had. And I lost five close friends uh, during the height of COVID in the same week. And I saw family members dropping their loved ones off to hospitals, never to see them again. Our city economy took a devastating hit. And so I'm laying all that out because this is a serious uh, uh, virus. COVID is a formidable opponent. And I believe the NBA and Kyrie can sit down and come to a conclusion, uh, but I'm a supporter on city employees getting vaccinated, particularly those first responders. Uh, I, I believe that we have to make sure we don't return to those days where more trucks were lined up at the hospitals. Uh, I, I feel that all of us have experienced PTSD uh, when COVID was out of control and we can't go back to that. Now question, um, crime in New York City has gone up crazy. How, how, how are we going to uh, make sure that we get crime down a lot? People are scared to go out to eat at restaurants. People are scared to go out to, to nightlife. People are scared to go anywhere in New York City because it seems like the robberies are up. How, how do we control that and stop that? And you're right, uh, Brother MV. Uh, and it has a lot to do, I use this term often on the campaign trail because I believe it, it's intervention and prevention. Uh, prevention is, you know, there are the long-term things we must do. Uh, let's look at where the prison population is and do an analysis of it, and we can find out what we need to do to prevent it. 30% of the people in prisons in our country uh, are dyslexic. 55% have a learning disability, and 80% don't have a high school diploma or equivalency diploma. That tells us that it's education. So if we want to prevent the feeders of crime, we have to deal with the educational crises that we experience, because if you don't educate, you will incarcerate. But then we have to deal with right now, and that's the intervention. And so we have to stop the flow of guns in our city that's coming from the southern state. That was part of the conversation I had with President Biden when I was able to go sit down with him. Uh, we need to put in place a gang and gun task force here in this city so we could do precision policing well, those gang members that are really causing a lot of the shootings and stabbings that you're seeing in the city. But it can't be just heavy handed. Uh, I met with some of the top gang members. Some of them have bodies and some of them have cases for bodies. Uh, and I sat down with them and said, listen, we have to uh, deal with ending this violence in our city. And I want to continue to collaborate with them, crisis management teams and others who are doing amazing jobs to stem the violence in our city. You know, it is we do check in quite frequently. So I know a lot of times we'll be repetitive in some of the things that we discuss. But I know you also have your final debate where Curtis Lee were ahead of uh, November 2nd. So let me ask you this. I saw there was like some back and forth about him saying that you refused to shake his hand and uh, you calling him a clown. <laughs> you called him a clown? Well, isn't he? I mean, come on. That is that is not something uh, that's unique to us. Uh, uh, Curtis is not a serious candidate. He doesn't think this is a serious issue. He believes this is some type of gang. And Ameri uh, New York is not a circus. And I'm not going to 
uh, participate in his buffoonery. And, you know, he wants to pull me into a slugfest, not talking about the issues. Uh, if you know, I was on, I was in the studio before Curtis. Curtis came in after me. I was taught as a child, when you walk in the room, you approach the person and you shake their hands. I'm not uh, going in my way or out of my way to shake his hand or not. I think it's just another way of distracting us. I tell my team, stay, stay focused, no distractions, and work hard and grind. That's it. I don't know any of this other stuff that he's trying to put into the race. Mm -hmm. uh, have your thoughts changed on any of the things now that you are pretty much about to be mayor in January? Uh, any of the uh, previous stances that, that you had taken and relationships with the NYPD? I even see vaccinations is such a big deal right now, and some people are not going to be able to work at their jobs because they're not vaccinated. So how do we come to any type of resolution? Because at the same time, it's hard to get employees right now. People are struggling financially, and we don't want to see that happen. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, no, we don't want to see it happen. And I know my, my positions haven't changed on, on anything. I continue to evolve and grow and learn. Uh, but uh, let's be clear, for 35 uninterrupted years, I have been in, the, in favor of public safety, uh, going after police reform. Uh, when you look at what I have done uh, in my professional career, testifying in federal court against stop and frisk, being mentioned uh, in the final ruling against the police department, fighting to end Rockefeller drug laws as a sergeant. I marched in protest to end Rockefeller drug laws, and then I went to Albany and co-sponsored the bill that repealed Rockefeller drug laws. And it was my bill that ended the database that innocent people were being held in stop and frisk. Their information was being held. I wrote that law and passed it. I wrote the law to stop police quotas. Uh, but at the same time, I've also introduced legislation to deal with the over proliferation of guns in our community. And so I am clear, and that was the message I sent out to the public, that I was not going to vacillate back and forth this is who I am. If this is the type of mayor you want, uh, please vote for me. And that is why I won the Democratic primary on being clear on my message. Now that we deal with this issue of, of vaccines and vaccination, you're right, Angie, we don't want people unemployed. But I cannot emphasize enough that if we don't manage COVID, people are going to be unemployed because our economy is going to be shot. We are in a serious deficit. Um, our office buildings, only 30% occupancy. People are back. People are not on the subway system. People are not going out and spending money in restaurants, getting their hair done, their nails done, buying suits. Uh, that is a devastating impact on the mm -hmm. ecosystem of our finance. Now, question, what about, um, I'm noticing that gas prices are shooting through the roof oh of the gosh. city right now. I mean, you know, at yes. one time they were $2, and now in, in certain areas it's four fifty, close to $5. What can we do to get those gas prices lower? They, they say the U.S. has a, you know, that has a, a ton of gas just reserved, reserved on the side. So why can't we let some of that reserve go so we can keep the prices low until we get some more? <laughs> yeah, no. Greater minds uh, than uh, than my mind understands the science behind the reserves and holding off of uh, the flow. That's a you know the federal discussion. Never they never want to reach a point where they run out totally. Uh, but that also moves us into another direction uh, that we have to cycle off of fossil fuel. And there's some great introductions uh, to uh, e electronic vehicles, and we need to cycle into those vehicles and stop producing uh, this the fossil fuel burning uh, energy that we are seeing. Uh, but, you know, part of that is a, a supply, a chain problem, you know, getting supplies here. And that goes back to the question that was raised about COVID. If we continue to have a supply chain problem of getting everyday supplies to the city, uh, it is going to impact our quality of life. The cost of goods and services are going to increase. So sometimes people say, well, me not getting vaccinated or me not going back to work has nothing to do uh, with the overall outcome of the city. And it does. It has a lot to do with, with it. If we don't get the city up and operating again, you're going to see an increase in prices, an increase in, in the quality of life of our city, and we can't allow that to happen. You have an open line of communication with Biden. So what are your thoughts on the Democratic Party right now? We see Andrew Yang left the Democratic 
Democratic Party formed his own party. Do you feel like Democrats right now are not being forceful enough in getting things done and getting legislation passed? Well, Andrew Yang is not a representative of the Democratic Party. Remember, he had not voted you know, prior to that. He decided to vote when he wanted to run for president. And so uh, we can't allow what he decides to do uh, to determine uh, the outcome of the Democratic Party. I think that all these parties are going through growing pains and it's imperative to stay on the ground and understand what uh, your constituency uh, is made of. You know, that's what happened during this primary. Uh, when I was talking about that we need to have proper policing, safety and justice, many people were ignoring the safety aspect of it. But I was on the ground. I was visiting those NYCHA developments. I was visiting the family members who were saying they felt unsafe. And I knew that safety was the prerequisite to prosperity and people wanted to make sure that their family members were safe. And so what the Democratic Party must do, in my opinion, is to get on the ground and listen to their constituencies to understand exactly what they what they're asking for. And we can't be so complicated. You know, you know what I find, Angie, I find that New Yorkers and Americans are very simple. They want clean streets, mm -hmm. safe communities and educate their children so they can live in an affordable housing environment. This is not complicated. They're doing their job paying taxes. Government must do its job in delivering the services that those tax dollars are paying for. Now, also, you know, I was in D.C. over the weekend, downtown D.C., and, and sometimes I frequent to Florida. And I noticed, even Toronto, I noticed that their cities, their downtowns look so damn clean, man. You could you could literally probably eat something off the floor, but no, then when you, you walk through Manhattan, <laughs> well, first of all, you can't get no food off the floor because the might the rats are there before you get it. How how can we possibly clean up New York City, and and how can we clean up you know some of the homelessness that's going on in New York right now? Hey, I love that question, uh, uh, brother Envy, because uh, clean, cleanliness is next to godliness, and that's what Mom told me as a child. And you're right. Uh, when you leave the airport and drive on the belt or the Van Wick, you see lined on the highway, the sides of the road, there's nothing but trash. You're seeing encampments returning. You're seeing garbage everywhere. You're dead on. It's not your imagination. And we need to go into a real uh, cleaning plan. It's about how do we make our city visibly presentable and clean? You know, no matter what you're going through, darn it, you have to be clean. And we need to deal with this home street homelessness problem. Uh, I'm going to partner uh, with organizations like Fountain House. It's an amazing organization. They give wraparound services to people who are dealing with mental health illnesses and can't live uh, on their own. Uh, so they provide uh, those services uh, to them. Uh, that is when you see street homelessness, for the most part, you're dealing with people with mental health illnesses. And we need to give them the support that they deserve. And then we just need to clean our city. We need to change the culture of let me just throw paper wherever I want. Let me just, uh, you know, uh, put bags out with trash that are left open. Uh, so we need to change that culture and then zero in on the rat problem. You know, we, all of us know we're seeing an increase in the level of rodents. Uh, we need to zero in. I had a, a device that was called Rat Trap. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an amazing device. We're going to see about deploying those rat traps throughout the city, particularly in high areas where rodents is a serious problem. Yeah, I'm scared to walk down the block on trash pickup day because I'm more scared of rodents than anything. <laughs> but <and laughs> yeah, listen, I'm with you. <laughs> I definitely want to talk about Rikers Island, too, because I know the plan is to close down Rikers Island. Is that still on schedule? Uh, it, it is on my schedule. I think it's important uh, that we changed Rikers. I was on Rikers almost uh, about a month and a half ago, you know, prior to the other electors visiting. Uh, and I saw, uh, you know, how terrible those conditions are. You know what you know what, what was what was interesting also, uh, Angie? I spoke to a young man who was in uh, one of the facilities, one of the uh, housing blocks. He was serving time. His dad was serving time upstate in the same facility that his grandfather served time in. That's what you call just institutional poverty, institutional criminality. And so if we don't stop the pipeline that feeds Rikers, everyone is focused on closing the building. I say we have to close the pipeline that feeds Rikers. And that young man 
I bet you if you were to do an analysis, I bet you he does not have education. He may be suffering from a learning disability or mental health. And so if we only stay and look at the, the back end of what we're doing with the facility in the building, we're going to have a constant flow, even if we have short, smaller jails, which is going to create smaller Rikers. And I don't want to do that. Uh, so I'm on I'm on a par to close the building, build smaller facilities, but I also want to close the pipeline that feeds Rikers. All right. right. Well, I know it's a busy day for you, so we'll let you go. But, you know, you got to keep on checking in with us. Even when you become the mayor, I'll be uh, (laughs) I'll be there to celebrate with you on November 2nd for sure. Thank you. And and when we break big news, we're going to come right to your show, sister. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you. Uh, You have been a solid, solid businesswoman, uh, a solid, you know, radio a personality, but you know, you in the community, you're doing some real good things. You, DJ Envy, and the whole crew there. And I thank you guys how you use uh, this uh, modem of communications to really empower people. And I appreciate you uh, so much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, too, you, you too. All right. We have Eric Adams. Thank you so much. It's the Breakfast Mayor Club. Mayor Eric Adams. Mayor Eric Adams. Okay. Hey.